There is wonder in these hills. So much life, so much beauty, so much mystery. The Cherokee word for mystery is usquanikti. Now, in our oral tradition, our people explain mysteries by telling stories. For example, to explain the mystery of how the world came to be, we tell the story of a great buzzard who was flying over the mud of the earth, and as he got tired, his wings began to beat the mud into rugged mountains and valleys. Now, this story at first was a little hard for me to appreciate because the terrain around my home in No Fire Hollow, where I grew up in the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, didn't include these rugged mountains and valleys. One of the most fascinating mysteries that I've recently learned about is the presence of oddly shaped trees that hold meanings we can only imagine. It seems clear that these trees were not bent by natural forces, but who did it and why? You know, to be honest with you, I never saw or heard of trees like this until I came to Red Clay, Tennessee. You see, Red Clay was the last capital of the Cherokee Nation before we were forced to move to Oklahoma in 1838. I'd like to know if this tree is something from my people's cultural past that we couldn't take with us to Oklahoma. I get involved with this story through a nonprofit group in Georgia called Mountain Stewards. They are a volunteer group of retirees who build trails that enable people to enter the forest and experience these beautiful mountains. Mountain Stewards started looking into these strange bent trees in 2005. The quest that started in their own backyard is a model for scientific exploration everywhere. A little research and they found they were not alone. At nearby Big Canoe, Georgia, there were numerous bent trees and rock cairns that had been protected and claimed as historically significant. Well, what if this tree could talk to us? What would it tell us? Another neighbor, a photojournalist, Elaine Jordan, had written a little book entitled Indian Trail Trees. I found out this reference to that he followed this trail of bent trees, and that really intrigued me. You know, as a journalist, you kind of think, oh, wow, because I had been seeing these bent trees around Gilmer County in this area, down in Jasper, Pickens County, up toward North Carolina Murphy. I had seen these bent trees, and I'd been taking a lot of pictures of these trees because they were a curiosity to me. There was one lady up in Missouri in the Ozarks who had done quite a bit of work. Her name was Laura Hubler. She called them thong trees because they were supposedly held down with another piece of cut wood that looks like a slingshot. She had talked garden clubs there in Missouri to protect these trees, so Missouri protects their thong trees. I bought the property in 78, and the tree was here then. Everywhere mountain stewards went, they were told that the trees were bent by Indians. He called them Indian trees. Said the old timers way back there, and the Indians always pointed them stored hangover bluffs or storage uh, in the our big springs. Well, I was born and raised here. This tree, I have always been told, was an Indian marker tree. From what I've been told through my family, my father, and, and stories he told before that, uh, his grandmother was a uh, Cherokee. They lived just a few miles down this very river. The trees, like the one you see behind me, were always told to him to be marker trees, Indian trees, uh, mark trails, river crossings. Oral tradition makes a strong case, and the trees themselves often make a strong impression on people who see them for the first time. For we Indian people, the impact can be profound. Standing in this place, I can feel the presence of my people. I can only imagine the pain and tribulations they must have experienced. And the tree raises so many questions. It points 
to the fantastic Blue Hole Spring that provided life-giving water to the community. But the tree is quite close to the spring, so it's hard to argue that it's needed to help someone find it. Did it have a ceremonial purpose? If bending trees was an important practice, why did we stop? Why is there no account of this in uh, white man's writings? See, we were forced out of this place in 1838, over 175 years ago. Is this tree even that old? I've seen some that I just don't see how they can be old enough. And I suspect that a lot of them are kind of random. A lot of skepticism in the group I work with. Dendrochronology is the science that uses tree rings and the pattern in tree rings to apply calendar dates to the wood. Oak trees are not known to put on false rings, missing rings, or locally absent rings. They put on one ring a year, and so they're very reliable. So they're going to tell you the year that they encountered a drought or an ice storm or they recorded a fire event or the year they were cut down. They don't lie. Mountain stewards could hardly wait to get into the woods. Dendrochronology taught them that coring trees does not hurt the tree any more than picking a handful of leaves and that oak trees die from the inside out. They're scattered all over the forest here and I know there's some type of a pattern if you were to lay out and grid out the Native American trails that these trees will coincide with some of the major, major roads. There's no doubt about that in my experience. You can put layers on Google Earth and so we would put Google Earth's bottom layer would be the, the terrain map. Then we'd put a topographic map, a modern topographic map, and get it to fit. Then we would put the template of where the plants would go and wiggle it into place. And then we plopped all these plants on top of that. Finally, up here, we could trace the trails because you can make anything transparent that you want to. And we have a beautiful map of the trails on Google Earth. And here's the best part. It looked like the maps in the books, except it was accurate. And, and it was much more complex and even better when we went out and looked for them, they were there. With the trails located on Google Earth, it became possible to program the coordinates into GPS units, go to a precise spot and look for evidence of the historic trails. Even though many of them have not been used in a very long time, they can usually find them, especially the ones dished out from use by wagons. As word spread that they were using science to try and solve the mystery, they sparked a grassroots effort to find more trees. We're always looking for them, and people know we're looking for them. They call us and say, oh, I saw one of those trees over there. We crossed Mill Creek to come and find this trail tree, and it's a major spring-fed uh, creek that runs into the Buffalo National River here at Pruitt. And this tree pretty well lines up as the river runs uh, down, makes a bend, and we'll find another big trail tree down in uh, that area. And uh, there's a lot of Indian artifacts found all in here. You can find arrowheads just walking up and down the river. But when we see a trail tree, we holler, trail tree, trail tree, there's one. And we all flock over and try to decide if it is a trail tree and start getting our GPSs out and our cameras and it's just made riding a, a real exciting, hasn't it, Nadine? <laughs> We've been down this road over the last seven, eight years, at least 80 to 100 times, you know, conservatively, and it's just now been discovered. The thing that excites me about it is it's a living piece of history. You know, you can read about things the natives did and all, but th these trees, you can actually go and find one, and who knows if if anybody else has even found the tree, or if they have, if they knew what it was, you know, it's just living history. That's why they must be preserved, obviously. In Cherokee, the word for a road is nanohi. Nanohi. And these roads, these paths, 
uh, these byways, these places where people have traveled, were actually much, much more important and much, much older than anybody can really imagine. The way in which they marked them, the bending of trees, the rocks, the rock cairns, were essentially very, very old markers. And these markers and these roads were actually a part of a great highway system that allowed people from many tribes to interact with each other. And there was an inordinate amount of trade going on. Things have been found in various places in other parts of the country that are only intrinsic to these mountains. Uh, things are found here that are really from someplace else. You begin to realize then why the uh, network of moving from one place to another became so important. The word removal is such an antiseptic name for the events that culminated with what we call Tudunatlohila, or the trail where they cried. The Trail of Tears ripped us away from our beloved mountains, but was only a part of the sad story of how our culture was almost destroyed. In 1872, only 2,000 Osages walked into this reservation. Only 2,000 walked in here alive. And it must have hurt so bad that they said, we're not going to talk about it no more. And they didn't. And they even made it almost taboo to talk about it. We can never get this back. What they did, what they were thinking, the life they led, their, their, their consciousness, their, their mentality, their intelligence, their ways, of the why they, how they did this, will never, never, we don't know how they did it. And we would, not, even if we knew in today's society, we could not do that. Our grandmother buried our family Bible. She did everything she could to deny that heritage she was afraid, really afraid. Um, when we started delving into our heritage and our family history, one cousin came forward and said, well, we have to go to the reservation. I said, what reservation? She said, you know, the Indian ter Territory in Oklahoma, well, we have to go there. Will they take us away? So we had older family members who still thought someone would come and get us and take us away, take our homes away, um, that we couldn't go to school, uh, voting rights, it was all connected. This very land where we're sitting today was where my husband was raised as a child. He was not aware of some of the things in this area back then. His mother was one that was sent to Fort Sill Indian School and punished for speaking her language. So they literally beat the language out of the children back then. We were whipped with a belt severely for speaking our own language. At the school, they didn't know, um, they couldn't pronounce our Indian names. So that they just, teachers gave us the names and that's how I became Jefferson. This trail uh, was used in the Trail of Tears as a removal route. 1,100 people moved west. This kind of marked the way, but it's, it's tragic now. But I guess different ones mean different things. Most of what we've seen, they mark the trails and they'll mark different things like water, uh, shelter, directions. I'm, I'm thinking they probably marked some ceremonial places too. Because there's a lot of prayers went on during that. It was Billy Shaw who first told mountain stewards that bent trees might have more than a utilitarian function. The idea that the trees might mark a place for prayer made them intensify their search for elders who could help them understand what they were all about. In 2007, they traveled west because they had heard that the Ute people bent trees in Colorado they called prayer trees. Well, I think most of the trees that have been found in these areas is they're all pointing to Pikes Peak. And that's the sacred mountain. You know, they're not just trail markers, but they're places where you could have an offering. There were three markings on this particular tree and we call it the, the Holy Woman tree. What they would do is bend the tree and 
this would like be the altar. The prayer is to Creator. This is where ultimately the prayer goes. And then you have um, speaking to the ancestors, because that's the important part of my travels. Muscogee Creek Elder Sam Proctor traveled with mountain stewards to South Georgia to search for a marker tree that he had been shown in a dream. He had been told in the dream that the tree pointed the way to water that was important for ceremonial use. We came down to check out a trail that uh, my people used to use, and uh, we found the uh, water hole that they spoke of. We found uh, the gully, but we didn't find, find the tree. English translates Indian languages very, very poorly. It tries, but it doesn't even get close, hardly. Neongasha, it's like an experience. Ni represents all the waters, the Buffalo River, the White River, the uh, Osage River in Missouri, all these rivers, Arkansas, all these waters. O is like all of it. All that's in there, the animals, the trees, the foliage, the trails, the, the life in there, the storms, the tornadoes, the winters, the summers, the people, all that ecosystem. Gasha is like a child playing. Neo Gasha is a playground for all of that. The people in that, that's kind of like their playground. The word for our home, the Wena Sa'i, and all Cherokees know that to be my home. That word, the Gwenessa, actually means from where I began. And so in your movements towards the day and stuff, you have that marker all the time, the Gwenessa, and we would reference that way, the place that I started from. We didn't have just four cardinal directions, we had seven. We had the east, north, south, and west, but we also had straight up, straight down, and right here, where you're at because where you're at at any given time is a direction. It's a direction from another place, and it's encoded in the language. It's all interconnected, and it leads to our concept of why these roads and why these pathways were important. It was a reminder as you move across these geographical areas of who you were, and what you were, and what your purpose was. And in this way, then, you were constantly being reminded then of this way in which you're supposed to live. So all of these crooked roads, all of these very complex systems that moved around were essentially, in our minds, very straight roads, almost as if they were in a straight line. Because it took us from one thing to another, to another, to another. And the purposes of movement across these places then was an accomplishment and one goal met one particular responsibility completed. Along that road was the road of life. It was the road of understanding about where you were at, who you were in the great picture of the universe. I want them to learn so they could know their ancestral land. That's real important to me. And I've cried a river, at me, oh no, I've cried an ocean over it. And I always tell them, you come from a strong group of people. Your ancestors were so strong because they lived in the mountains. I think, wow, my ancestors walked on the same trail and I'm here. And it just, it really touches my soul. My ancestors need a voice. And I feel like that I have been, you know, one of the chosen people to speak the truth of our ancestors. And I want to know more. I want to know the songs. I want to know the dances. I want to know the ceremonies. So it's like I'm just barely at the tip of the iceberg now. This eternal fire is the same fire that we took with us when we had to leave here. It was brought back to this place by runners from Oklahoma in 1984. It was the first joint council between East and West in almost 150 years. In 2009, another joint council celebrated a 25-year reunion. 
the Cherokee people were reconnecting and finding that we faced many issues in common. Now the elders are all leaving us and uh, the, young, uh, the young adults, young parents are beginning to realize that they should have listened. We'll never be able to catch all of the young people because they've already assimilated into the world, into the society. But if we can get at least 50% of them realizing that uh, what we're telling them is very important to their lives, then we've accomplished a lot of the things that we want to. We were taught that we're the caretakers. We do not own the land. It was given to us. We have to take care of it, and if we don't, it's taken away from us. As urban development occurs, the forest gets cut down and these trees die off. Here you see a trail tree marking the area, one of the ones that has died, and it won't be there much longer. Here we are in a national park. This is Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument. And we are a fossil park, but what we also do is interpret the Native American history here, the history of the first people on the land. We find that very, very important. Did we Indians bend these trees? Science says yes. Our elders say yes. There's a tree, a big old tree. How was our culture almost annihilated? It's a dark story with ongoing issues. Something, uh, you know, has happened here, and uh, we don't think too much of this uh, piece of uh, metal that's standing here, and it disgraces our marker. And it could have been put anywhere else besides here on the sacred grounds. Can cultures learn to share? Can meanings be recovered? Each question answered points to even greater mystery. I remember my grandfather set me aside one time, and grandson, what do you see? I said, well, I see grandma and the aunties, I see them cooking, her, you know. He said, what else do you see? I said, I see a fire. It looks like it's pretty hot. Yeah, but he said, look at that piece of wood in there. See how bright that fire is? I said, yeah. That's the last blessing that that tree can give. I like that. A world that offers blessings makes living worthwhile. In Cherokee cosmology, plants bring healing power and trees exhibit great power. Now, many of our uses for plants take away the life of the plant, but using a tree in a way that keeps the tree alive lets us continually tap its power and lets each person who comes into its presence find the meaning it holds. What I'm finding out is that the prayer trees on their own were family trees, and I would have to know the families. What were they thinking? What did they want to gain? What did they want to tell? It is a mystery to everybody, even us that uh, know a lot about the trees that we were told about them. All of the information is, is a mystery. Do we need these trees? Ah, probably not for their original intended purpose. Do they still hold meaning? I say yes. See, these bent trees still remain on the land, and we Indian people are also still here. The trees, they will eventually go, but we will not. Our ways can never be quite the same, but we can find ways to rekindle and hold on to the deep fundamental values of our cultural heritage. We can tell our story. We can tell our story so the broader public can understand, and we can still discover meanings in the natural world if we will take the time to look. A chilota, a chilota, a chilosta, gonna know. 
no no he and uh, that's a marker of the no no he is the road a chi lota is the marker in our Cherokee language The words hold many secrets. They are full of mystery. Take your time and be patient. When you stop moving, you start to notice things. Critters that hid as you approach, they resume activity. You become a part of the place where you are, and the place becomes a part of you.